question. Please feel free to come from. People always say when they're in the hole, the questions disappear, and then they go outdoors and they're all the questions. <laughs> Why didn't I ask this? Why didn't I ask that? I think my grandmother's father on the 7th of July. And this day was a funeral. So um, we'd like to ask advice from uh, Mante to um, let my family members know and myself. Um, as a family member, what we can do for her and um, yeah. Okay. I went, I imagine you've already had some merit making ceremony, don't you? Yeah, we have rings and then a lot of rings and all yeah. um, the funeral. So that's a good start. Yes. Uh, on a long-term basis, maybe you know, on an anniversary or from time to time, you may also make some more merit with some more dollar donation, whatever. On a more day-to-day uh, -day basis, maybe if you're somebody who meditates, chant, you can chant and meditate and dedicate to Granny. Um, carry on doing more good things in your life in her name, for her to remember her by, to honor her, because she would probably want you to carry on doing good things, leading your life in a good way, a skillful way. And that's also another thing you can do if you are, I don't know how close you were to your grandmother, but if you ever, if you can remember some of the things she would say and do in her life, then when you're missing her, feeling sad or just thinking of her, you can bring up those reflections and remember some of the things she said. She may have said some very wise things or given you good advice in different situations. You remember, what would Granny say? Or what did she say about this? Or what was she like? She was very kind, she was very helpful, did this, did that. Bring up those memories to help motivate you to follow her good example and help you to feel proud and happy that you your grandmother, even though she's gone now, that's sad, but you have the good memories and the good qualities that she's inspired in you. And you carry on your life by following in her example, remembering her, and doing the sort of things she would encourage you to do. What most grandmothers have just gotten their children and grandchildren to study well, work hard, be good people, kind people, helpful people, help each other in the family, not always to argue, <laughs> and practice the Dhamma. Practice generosity, sila, bhavana, chanting, listening to Dhamma. So use, use the loss of grandmother, which is sad, to actually spur you on energize you to do more good things. She's a very patient and very kind of well, lady. That's, that's what you can remember. You say, I have to be patient like Granny. And she's 94 years old. 94. 94. Oh, 94. Yes. Okay, good long life. <laughs> and the Buddha said long life is the fruits of keeping the first precept. Not killing. Other beings, other people, other animals. But that's also something you can learn from Granny. Thank you. Thank you,
from my brother to for the treatment and also Chaka also support them financially. So at times now that I learn more about karma, right, I kind of like also accepting the fact that my father may pass on anytime. But because of I am thinking so, I feel that in front of the other family members, I am being seen like quite cruel. <laughs> So I just would like to ask, uh, would like to understand further and ask Ajahn whether this feeling that I have right now is the still in the right path in the Theravada teaching? Because why? Why? Why would they think you're cruel? I think because in generally in the Chinese family, they would think that um, you know seeing that. So lightly is kind of like cruel in the family. This is not just Chinese family. Uh, uh, many people who meditate and have reflected on impermanence often for many years, when it comes to the time for close loved ones to pass away and they remain calm. Many people who don't meditate and don't know the Dharma will criticize them in this way. It's very common. You just have to be patient and don't give in to any negativity yourself. If somebody criticizes you, try to explain, but if they don't understand, just forgive them and, and, and don't argue. Just accept it. If they criticize you and they don't understand you, you just have to accept it and be compassionate for them. Um, because you know what you're doing is right, it's good. You have no ill intention. So if you know yourself, then even though the words of other people can be hurtful and you misunderstand, you don't have to give them too much importance because you know what you're doing and why. Uh, and if you're helping your father, paying for his medicine, taking him there, doing as much as you can, you're doing a very good thing. This is a very good karma. And any reasonable person like me, I'm an outsider, I say, well, that's a really good thing you're doing. Of course, the family, because they're so close together, you know, there's always misunderstanding, arguments, and they don't always see the good that's being done. So you have to be very patient with that, and don't judge them too much, just be compassionate and accept that they, they, they don't practice Buddhism like you do, or the same kind of Buddhism that you do. Just have to accept that. Don't, don't worry too much about it. And I know it may be challenging, you know, they have their opinion, they tell you. Just be trying to be very calm, patient, and strong. Keep doing the good work of looking after Father. And you hear their opinion, you just listen, you respect their opinion, but you don't have to agree with it. Understand. Yes, I will continue to transfer my weights for my parents, but father. Thank you so much for your advice, Ajahn. Okay. I feel much better now. Okay. Thank you. Uh, 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 good evening, uh, Bob. Uh, my question is regarding the uh, developing of a meditation uh, for a lay person. So I'm practicing now. So since I'm ready for five years, and uh, the result or the old man is just so so. You know, some body sensation and uh, mind, mind make things and then and as a as a uh, sucking happening, you know, phenomenon. And then uh, samadhi is something calmness, but it cannot, cannot uh, last it forever. So practicing, practicing, practicing and uh, the way of a uh, lay person self self practicing cannot. We go until to uh, maybe I would say uh, higher, higher meditation process. Like maybe monk uh, in the temple, they, they can uh, achieve jhana or all these things, you know. So, uh, how long can help us we as a lay person in a, in a family? Of course, it's very, very, very difficult. We are living with a with member of a family unless. We have to catch the tempo. And then you have the teacher to guide you. That, that will be my opinion. 
keep it quite simple, straightforward, practice mindfulness, can practice the precepts, and your whole lifestyle is going more like the lifestyle of a monk, and, and particularly you're training yourself to shy away from anything unwholesome, unskillful. You know, one of the great precepts, even if other people are cruel or hard on us, we don't fight back and hurt them, we're very patient, try and solve our problems in a reasonable way, a peaceful way. So your whole lifestyle is actually reflecting the same qualities as if you were in a monastery, you go your way to labor. And people can do this. Does that make sense? Uh, uh, my, uh, myself, from the beginning I've been facing this meditation, I was very hard working. You know, then after all, uh, it's a uh, disappointment and then, and then, you know, uh, then why not just, just do it myself. Then after all, I got the experience of a Maybe two weeks or maybe one month, so you're able to do more, better, <coughs> better development. So that will be continuous, continuous, you know, nothing you would think about. My mindfulness is bad, so you are something like all closer to the Dharma. So that, that, that will be fine, but we, we can't do it, we can't do it uh, in every time unless. Well, maybe you work towards that like, once a year or once in a while, you can do a retreat. Shorter one, longer one, depending how much time you can find. But even if you do go on retreat, even if you put a lot of effort into meditation and it goes quite well, you still have the main challenges when you come home with it. <laughs> That's why you need to develop the discipline in your lay life, as well as retreats. Retreats are good, I'm not saying don't do them, but you also have to learn how to practice in the daily, on a daily basis. Another thing you can do, like if you practice dharma regularly, sharing, supporting, volunteering, giving things away, you'll reach a point where you've given away so much, you know, I might as well just become a monk. <laughs> a lot of people are like that. It's like you just do it to the point of what's the point of earning money and doing all this anymore? I'm not going to live in the monastery. And they do. And they're ready for it because they've got to that point by practicing dharma, helping society, they've done it enough. Now they're ready to practice. They have no more doubts. Like Lumpo, was it Lumpo Boa? I can't remember. I think it was Lumpo Boa. Forest Ajahn in Thailand many years ago. He, uh, he worked very hard. He uh, was a businessman. He had a farm. He had cattle. He had equipment. He had money. And he also did trading. And he was very successful because he worked hard, he was honest, he was kind. He had a wife, he had children, but he was giving things away, supporting the monks, practicing the Dhamma. He reached a point where he said, I meditate every day, I practice Dharma, I might as well just go and live in the monastery. <laughs> so he did. He had this, made this decision, and his wife said, Well, if you're going, I'm going. She also had faith in the Buddha and in the teachers. He said, okay, the kids have grown up and they can look after themselves. So make sure the kids had everything they need and then they had a huge giveaway in their part of Thailand, very poor. And they said, for the next three days, anyone who needs anything you can get. And they were giving away cattle, sacks of rice equipment, everything, and eventually they gave the land to the other family members. There was nothing left, and they went, each became a monk and a nun. And he, within a few years, he became enlightened. He just gave everything away. There was nothing more he wants from the world, and he knew that. And he was quite old, he was already in his 40s or 50s when he did this. And he came to live with Lung Man, who you know Lung Man, a very famous teacher. And Lung Man, the first thing he said is, you young monks, you know, the 20 year olds who are strong and young and think they're really good, but you can't match the oldie. Because the oldie is here with real wisdom, real faith, and so within a few years he became enlightened. Because he really put his heart into it. In the end, whether you're a lay person or a monk, it's the heart that matters. How can we keep how much faith, how much effort we put in? And 
that talk to us. It's not a choice. Okay, and Philip Paul, Again, no need to react, get upset or angry or anything. 
it's not true, and if they're there, maybe you can explain to them what the truth is, what happened. Or even if they don't listen or they're not there, you can't do that. You just know for yourself that it's not true, so I don't need to worry about this. What they're saying is not true. I can let this go. And anyone asks afterwards, you say, well, it's not true. But you have to establish mindfulness to do this. You have to be able to establish the mindfulness, see what they're saying, and then think, well, what is true, what is correct here. Sometimes there's nothing you need to do at all. You pray if you're okay. Pray and you carry on. Like you say, you just do it and you carry on. Sometimes. Other times there may, you may, may need to respond. Say it's a young person that pray to you. You could maybe help them to say, look, what I'm doing, maybe you can do as well. Maybe you should join in and help them do something like this. So they praise you, but then you turn it back and say, maybe this is the time for you to come and step up and do something. If you feel well, I'm a good example, well, maybe you can also do something like this and experience the joy, the happiness like I do. You explain to them. Uh, you know, there's different situations, you may respond differently. But first of all, it's always just establish mindfulness. What are they saying? Is it true? Is it right? Is it not? to try and compose yourself so you don't just react with emotion all the time. We're all trying this, whether it's in our meditation or just in interaction with each other. Establish the mindfulness of speech can be skillful, you can reflect, think about, think about what's going on in that situation, how you feel, what's going on, and then decide what the right thing to do is. That's our aim. Uh, then, uh, my my skill is um, minus. There's not even zero. It's minus. You can ask him any time. So, but it's strange uh, uh, for me. I notice the mind because of following the teachings. It's observing my mind. Is that if anybody criticizes me, I seem to like. Okay. You don't agree with me, fine, you do a better job. The mind will go into that. Then if you keep on criticizing, if I find out you'll be going around and coming back to me, sometimes the reaction will be very good. Maybe, I find maybe, a way to maybe one thing you can do is the preventative part of this. In the morning, you do a little meta meditation every morning. You get up, <laughs> you better meditate yourself, you be well. Good day, good things go well for me. May everyone I meet be well, healthy, happy, may things go well for them. You set your mind in the right position, the right place first, and then for the rest of the day you keep returning to that thought so that when things happen, people say something, and you're starting to get fired up, you say the wrong thing, you go back and the better, um, just calm down. Let this one go. See if you can do it. You know, if you can do it once, you can do it a second time, a third time, a fourth time. See what you can do in this respect. Practice the meta. How can you introduce this into the way you talk to people and relate to them? I think that you're here and talking about this, about this means you can do it definitely. Otherwise, you wouldn't be here and able to talk about this. But I think it's actually a small thing for you. Just need a little adjustment. And People, things will go better. It, it, it comes to me, it's like somebody gives me praise. I get like, the mind goes into suspicion. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. if, if let's say, you know, me, uh, hey, I told this is not, you know, this should be done. I, I, don't, I don't feel like I need to bash it or something. And I go like, go <laughs> you know, I, there's no element of suspicion. I can take it and okay, if she don't agree with me, and she finds out you do it, and then okay, well you do it. Or if anybody but if people give me breaks, I would like, oh yeah, it's it's definitely you know that's suspicion. Just work with it, catch yourself. <laughs> It's like that dog, we're at the house today and there's a dog with it like that. And you stroke it and you're like, I was trying to be kind to you.
for those who passed away. Strictly speaking, it's a class of hungry ghosts who can receive merit. And since the time of the Buddha, Buddhists have been dedicating merit to the dead just in case they're hungry ghosts. And sometimes people have dreams, hungry ghosts come or they even see somebody. It could be someone very close or a distant relative or a friend or a neighbor or someone. And the, um, they have some intuition somehow that someone is suffering, so they do an act of merit making and dedicating to the, that person in the wish that may improve their state of mind wherever they are. And they're a hungry ghost, they're in a state of suffering. So you offer robes to monks, offer sangharana, food, you do some act of charity, you meditate and you dedicate this to the person in the hope this can help uplift them. And it may work, and it has worked in the past, so it, people will probably carry on doing this, so why not? Maybe the person doesn't actually need merit, maybe not. We don't always know because we are not fully um, psychic and we don't know these things maybe, but we do it anyway. And you do it as a good thing to practice when somebody has passed away just in case they're in a state of suffering to share or dedicate merit to them. And don't forget the one making the merit, us, and the people we're involved with, we're also benefiting. And you might say, what's the point? I can't see a, a ghost, I don't know if my merit will reach them, if they can rejoice, if it will help them, I don't know. True, you don't know. You're going on the words of the Buddha and other teachers. So you don't know yourself, maybe, but you have wise teachers who have suggested this is happening. But you do know your own heart. And if your own heart is developing good qualities from making better, well, that's a good thing, isn't it? And maybe there's people around who don't know much about this, but you're helping them to do something good and they feel good, like children or someone who is not a very spiritual person, but you say, let's make merit for someone who's passed away. They might see a good, that's a good thing, and they'll feel good about what they've done. Thank you very much. Thanks. So we, we would like to give a <coughs> blessing in appreciation of the uh, Generous offering tonight, and while we chant the blessing, we encourage you all to share the merits, dedicate the merits with your loved ones, departed loved ones, those you know and remember, and even those you don't know, don't remember, but may be there, and share the merits with them as we chant. And of course, you yourself, we wish you all good health long life, happiness, and progress in the Dhamma towards Nibbana. <laughs>